show me. Matrix is coming back, a new installment to the franchise that perfectly blended post-apocalyptic science fiction with Hong Kong-style kung fu and a healthy dose of metaphor that the internet has spent its entire life trying to decode. The first Matrix was an action revolution right on the doorstep of Hollywood, but the impact may have had a few other side effects. Before Neo flicked his nose like Bruce or Trinity kicked like Cynthia Rothrock, American martial arts movies were completely different. They were cheesy, cheap, and for many people, completely awesome. So, this new Matrix has me asking, did the Matrix kill American martial arts movies? Before we get into it, I wanted to let you guys know to stick around for the end of this video because I am doing a giveaway right here of Twinkle Twinkle Lucky Stars. This Blu-ray copy, it is region A. This is going to be a uh, giveaway for only people in the US because I can only ship in the US for this. Uh, epic Jackie Chan Summer Hung Yuan Biao Three Dragons film. It is wonderful. I'm going to tell you how you could win this after the video. Before we talk about American martial arts cinema, we need to look at what was going on across the world in the late 90s. All the way over in Hong Kong, action movies were hitting heights many believed Hollywood simply could not touch. Hong Kong made kung fu movies dating back to the beginning of film, but the late 60s was the start of a boom period that would last 30 years. The 70s continued to grow with Bruce Lee, Angela Mao, the crop of stars from Shaw Brothers, and led from the late 70s into the 80s where Sammo Hung, Yuan Biao, Jackie Chan, Jet Li, and so many more took their industry to unforeseen action heights. The stunts, the action, the movies were so good that people had to ask, how did you make it look like those guys were falling off of a building? Well, those guys fell off a building. How did you make it look like that guy got kicked in the face? He's got a concussion. He was kicked in the face. Or how did you make it look like that little girl was dangling from a speeding car? Yeah, that little girl was dangling from a speeding car. There's uh, no way around that, you know. Not everything was perfect. They continued the excitement into the 90s. There was no way the Hong Kong action scene could just dissolve. Except that's exactly what happened. Now, this topic probably deserves its own video, but the crash of Hong Kong's film industry was the result of a perfect storm of trouble. Taiwan, who is a major investor in the industry, decided to invest in its own movies. Britain handed Hong Kong back to China in 97, so censorship became an even bigger worry. US films became extremely popular in Hong Kong theaters, so crowds would rather see Jurassic Park than the latest domestic action movie. Jackie Chan and many others started filming English-speaking movies in other countries and bringing them back to Hong Kong rather than make a movie in their own streets anymore. Stars were trying their luck in America and finding success. John Woo, known for Hong Kong classics like The Killer and A Better Tomorrow, hits it big directing Van Damme and Hard Target. He follows that up with two even bigger hits in Broken Arrow and Face Off, movies starring some of Hollywood's biggest stars. Jackie Chan sees more Hollywood success than he's ever seen with Rumble in the Bronx. With those films, Hong Kong's biggest figures needed no other evidence that they would find more success in Hollywood than they were finding in the current state of Hong Kong's film industry. The biggest players in Hong Kong made their way to the West. Samo Hung comes over for the TV show Martial Law. With him comes his entire stunt team. Chow Yun-Fat, one of the biggest stars in Hong Kong in the 90s, comes over for the replacement killers. Jackie Chan comes with his entire stunt team. And The Matrix utilizes the talents of perhaps the most important figure in all of Hong Kong Kung Fu cinema. When you're watching a fight scene, you probably only think of the people on screen. Samo Hung's destructive kung fu, Yuan Biao's acrobatic brilliance, Jackie Chan's hilarious action comedy, Jet Li's flawless style, Donnie Yen's lightning fast intensity. They are what we see, so they are on the mind. But 
the person behind the scenes who is responsible for each of the fight scenes you just saw is the godfather of kung fu. Yuan Wu-Ping is the fight coordinator, action director, or just straight up director of many of the greatest kung fu films ever made, starring all of your favorite on-screen fighters. When the Wachowskis needed someone to help craft fight scenes that were going to turn Hollywood upside down, they turned to Wu-Ping. At first, he was reluctant, but when he demanded full control of the action and was given just that, he made his way to America. Just like that, a majority of the most important players in Hong Kong were taking the stage in Hollywood. With the Hong Kong stuff out of the way, we need to fill the gap back in the West. While Hong Kong cinema was going through a 30-year kung fu boom, the West wasn't slacking, it just took them a little longer to figure things out. Anything mirroring a martial arts craze in America started in 1973 with Bruce Lee's Enter the Dragon. Throughout the 70s, there isn't much on-screen martial arts aside from a few black exploitation movies with Jim Kelly, Rudy Ray Moore, or Pam Greer. By the end of the 70s and into the 80s, Chuck Norris sets the pace for martial arts movies in America. The Octagon, Good Guys Wear Black, and Lone Wolf McQuaid. Into the 80s is when America really started to understand the assignment. Jackie Chan gives his first real effort in America with 1980s Battle Creek Brawl. In 84, we get Karate Kid, Jim Kata, American Ninja, and No Retreat, No Surrender in 85, the latter being directed by one of Hong Kong's best in Corey Yuen. Oh, and uh, Jackie Chan gave Hollywood another try with The Protector, but that went so poorly he went back to Hong Kong and would not return for another 10 years. 1988 became one of the most important years for American martial arts movies. Van Damme and Seagal made their leading man debuts with Above the Law and Bloodsport. From here on out, American martial arts is reaching similar heights to their contemporaries in the East. Van Damme is coming out with hit after hit and Seagal, at least in his first five outings, is keeping up with him. Through the 90s, you also get people like Cynthia Rothrock, Jeff Speakman, and Don Wilson coming out with some serious contenders. Mark Dacascus made some of my personal favorites. If you haven't seen Drive, you need to. Jackie Chan returns in 95, the same year as Mortal Kombat, for Rumble in the Bronx, seeing enough success to come back in 1998 with Rush Hour. And this finally brings us to the year of our Sentinel Machine Overlords, 1999, where we can finally talk about the actual focus of today's topic. With Yuan Wu-Ping in charge and demanding nothing but the best, he requires that the actors be trained in various forms of wushu, so that they could be in as much of the fight scenes as possible to help achieve authenticity and as little cutting as possible. I'll tell you one thing, that first, those first two days kicked my ass. After the first day, I was so shattered and so shocked and I realized I was so unfit and we had so much to do. And I was working with these incredibly skilled Hong Kong performers who were looking at me like, he'll never get there. Keanu Reeves showed well before John Wick that he was willing to put an incredible effort into film prep when he trained with a neck injury. Much of the cast weren't just doing the choreography, but their own wire work as well. Pretty much as long as the character wasn't being slammed into something, that's the actor. With the godfather of kung fu, actors willing to put in 110% and a directing team that had nothing but respect for the genre they were able to make a Hong Kong caliber martial arts film for Western audiences. The fight scenes are dazzling with Yuan Wu Ping flair, perfectly captured with wide angles and excellent character work. The success of the film proved that audiences wanted to see an authentic martial arts action on screen. Unfortunately, Hollywood took this lesson and uh, twisted it into something grossly inauthentic. So the 90s ended up being a pretty awesome decade for martial arts movies that beautifully rose to this crescendo that is The Matrix. Surely all of those 90s stars that have already been making martial arts films were called to make huge movies in the new millennium. Surely. Right? I mean, let me, hold on, let me look at my notes. Uh, oh, yep, just double check the notes here. Um, no, that, uh, that did, that didn't happen. Nope. They, uh, mm -mm. Uh, it's, uh, my bad. In the 2000s, those martial arts stars of the 90s and 80s were mostly relegated to B-movies, the bargain bins, straight to the shelves of Blockbuster where you wondered if you should watch In Hell 
half past dead, or just rent the Dark Crystal again. Seagal did have exit wounds with DMX in 2001, though. <laughs> With many of the American martial arts stars stuck in the low budget section, someone had to take to the silver screen. This sort of went two ways. Uh, remember what I said about Hollywood learning a lesson from the Matrix, but also twisting it for evil? Yeah, well, uh, the 2000, year 2000 may be the perfect example of that. In 2000, Jackie Chan partnered up with another Hollywood funny man in Shanghai Noon. Just as well, Jet Li won fans over in his starring role alongside Aaliyah in Romeo Must Die. These are perfect examples of Hollywood taking its lessons from the Matrix and brilliantly capitalizing on it. This is also a perfect evolution of the Hong Kong movement over to Hollywood, two of Hong Kong's top stars becoming action superstars to mainstream American audiences. You love to see it. What you don't love to see, though, is what also happened in 2000. The Matrix showed that audiences loved seeing major stars doing their own fights. But it was more than that. It was the stunning choreography, it was the Hong Kong style long takes, and it was the actors working their asses off to look authentic. In the same year as Shanghai Noon and Romeo Must Die, we also got Charlie's Angels. Sure, it's fun, and the trio of Barrymore, Lou, and Diaz was delightful, but no one is re-watching Charlie's Angels for the fight scenes. It's awkward choreography, it's awkward wire work, awkward movement. Going back and watching these fight scenes, it feels like it's kind of the allure of the action that it's so awkward, but almost in the way you watch cringe 2000 films with your friends for a laugh. Some of the choreography feels like they were trying to copy off the Matrix's homework and somehow still got the answers wrong. On the other side of Hollywood getting it wrong, some people are going to be a little bit upset about this, it's the Bourne series. In this case, you have Matt Damon, who clearly prepared. He looks fantastic behind the scenes, and in a strategy that has been used in more recent years to great success, the bad guys are played by stunt guys who can fight. This is typically a winning formula. All you have to do is capture it on camera. And that did not happen. The Bourne films are full of nauseating shaky cam, everything from a discussion between characters to walking across the street is shaking. It helps make the scene feel frantic for all parties involved, sure, but it also just destroys a fight scene. The choreography isn't awkward, Damon's performance is good, but does that matter if you can't see any of it? In my opinion, it makes it nearly unwatchable. So with people like Seagal and Van Damme being mostly relegated to B-movies and Hollywood films having dreadful fight scenes, it seems like the 2000s were pretty bleak, right? I mean, not really. Jackie Chan and Jet Li still did some awesome stuff. Rush Hour sequels, Jackie Chan made a bunch of family-friendly movies that, you know, when I was six were great, but looking back on, maybe not so good. Jet Li made some awesome stuff, Cradle to the Grave, Kiss of the Dragon, Unleashed, The One. Definitely better than the medallion and the tuxedo. Jackie and Jet eventually teamed up for the first time. They never did it in Hong Kong, but they did it here in America in Hollywood for uh, the Forbidden Forbidden Kingdom with Yuan Wuping uh, as the uh, as the coordinator. Fantastic! It worked really really well. But Jackie Chan and Jet Li were not the only ones getting a lot of work done in the 2000s. Quentin Tarantino is a lover of all things cinema, and couldn't resist the urge to make a martial arts film of his own. He did just that with 2003's Kill Bill, an homage to kung fu films and samurai films of the past. He's a student of the game, so he understood what had to be done. The choreography works, the camera captures everything it should, and the fights are pretty damn good. The second installment, Kill Bill Vol. 2, brings in Yuan Wu Ping for fight coordinator, and we also get Hong Kong legend Gordon Liu as Pai Mei. So, yeah, that's pretty dope. Yes, I know Gordon Liu is in the first film, but his role is so inconsequential, it really could have been anyone. There's one more thing to talk about. 
As I've mentioned, Van Damme and Seagal were put in the B-movie category after 2000. The other 90s stars are given even less to do. Mark Dacascus has two awesome movies, very good movies, but one is from Hong Kong and one is from France. Cynthia Rothrock and Don Wilson made a few movies together, but nothing to the scale that they were doing in the past. However, the 2000s did give us a few new contenders. 2006 may be the year where martial arts B-movies started to get awesome again. 2006 gave us Undisputed 2, starring Michael Jai White, who made a good name for himself in the late 90s. The first Undisputed starred Wesley Snipes and Ving Rhames, but neither would return for the sequel. Michael Jai White would take over the Ving Rhames role, but they needed a new villain. Enter Scott Adkins. Someone who had been doing stunts in Hong Kong and playing henchmen in films like The Medallion, Undisputed 2 remains a modern martial arts classic and would lead both White and Adkins to further success. White would follow up with a fantastic 2009 putting out Blood and Bone and Black Dynamite, the former remaining many people's favorite Michael Jai White film, and Black Dynamite is the perfect comedic love letter to black exploitation cinema that White grew up with. Time to clear war on anybody who sells drugs in our community. But Black Dynamite, I sell drugs in the community. Adkins put out Ninja in 2009, followed by an incredible sequel several years later, but most importantly, he took over the Undisputed series with 2010's Undisputed 3 Redemption, which is just fantastic. The martial arts B-movie is back. Back to the whole purpose of this video. The question, did The Matrix kill the American martial arts movie? Well, in the years after The Matrix, we got top kung fu stars making damn good kung fu films in Hollywood, but on the other end you have movies trying to copy the success of The Matrix, but not understanding what made it good. Hollywood A-listers were making cringe, nauseating fight scenes, while the stars of the pre-Matrix world were making mediocre action films in the, in the B-movie area. It wouldn't be until 2006 when the B-movie would rise again by almost recreating that 80s action formula. I put together this chart. I tried my best to go through all the years since 1973 and try to find as many martial arts movies as I could in every single year. So I'm probably missing some, but I think I've done a good job with this chart and sort of representing how the trend of martial arts cinema went in America for the past few decades. I thought that there would be a more negative skew towards the 2000s, and, and there's a slight dip, but not much to actually call it a decline in martial arts cinema. As you can see, a year like 2003 looks very similar to a year like 96, 94, 97. But what I figured out after going through all this, after doing some research and, and looking at the numbers here, it's not about how many movies came out. It's not about the number. It's about the context behind the number. So I ask one more time, did The Matrix kill the American martial arts movie? On some level, yes. The martial arts movie that many Americans knew through the 80s and 90s was certainly dead, but it wasn't just The Matrix's fault. It was the Hong Kong migration as a whole. Jackie Chan in Rush Hour in 98, Jet Li as the villain in Lethal Weapon 4, Michelle Yeoh in Tomorrow Never Dies, and Yuen Wu Ping's work on The Matrix were all factors in the evolution of martial arts in American cinema. If anything, The Matrix was the exclamation point at the end of the Hong Kong movement to America. The Matrix was the finale to the statement that told Hollywood that Kung Fu was awesome. They learned that in 73 with Bruce Lee, and they forgot. Not just Kung Fu, but clean, visible, precise martial arts on screen was the way to go. The same exact methods that made The Matrix so good are the same methods that make the John Wick series so epic. The stunt crew of The Matrix, Chad Stahelski and David Leach, went on to create 8711, a stunt organization that has been responsible for some of the greatest action films of the modern era. Elements of the Hong Kong style remain in Hollywood today because of the period that The Matrix defines. Anything that came before The Matrix had to step aside for a new action style. The style wasn't always done justice thanks to films like Charlie's Angels and The Bourne franchise, but it's a style that has endured because it breeds brilliance. 
I love a good old fashioned Van Damme fight scene and the style has returned thanks to the likes of Scott Adkins and many more. But I feel comfortable saying that the Hong Kong movement and the Matrix may have indeed killed the American martial arts film. But what was born, what rose from the ashes of that era is something that any martial arts fan is happy to see on their screen. Hey everybody, Martial Arts Film Freak here to let you know how you could win this giveaway copy of Twinkle Twinkle Lucky Stars. This is my old copy. I have watched it a few times. I can guarantee you, I promise you, I take good care of my stuff. This disc is nice and clean, no cracks. Again, you must be in the US to participate and here is how you can win. I am going to post a trivia question in the comments. I will pin it, it will be the top comment. A trivia question about this movie. I want you to answer that question and leave me your Instagram handle in the comment. That is how I will get to you. If I pick you, I'm going to pretty much just sort of raffle it through there. Whoever gets the question right and leaves me their Instagram handle, I'll do what I got to do there, figure out who the winner is, and I will contact you on how I'm going to get this to you. That is how you can win Twinkle Twinkle Lucky Stars. Fantastic movie, amazing fight scenes, perfect 80s Hong Kong action cinema. Comment your answer, your correct answer, with the thingy. Yep. Again, I will leave a question in the comments, trivia question about this movie. You must answer it correctly and leave me your Instagram handle. That is how you can win Twinkle Twinkle Lucky Stars. This is also Region A, so it should play on a majority of American viewers' players. So what did you all think of this little discussion here? Do you think The Matrix, do you think the Hong Kong movement to American cinema uh, affected people like Van Damme, Seagal, what we knew as American martial arts movies. Do you think it put it all on the back burner? It put it down to a lower, lesser level than uh, what it was before? Tell me your thoughts on that in the comment section down below. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Head over to Facebook with Riz the Martial Arts Film Freak Facebook page, Instagram Martial Arts Film Freak, Tristan underscore Glover on the Twitter, and uh, Martial Arts Film Freak on TikTok. Thank you so much for watching and have a good day.